We teach that the story of America, the story of the West, is a story of tyranny and oppression, when in reality, the story of the West is this amazing story of overcoming those things. Well, we're here with Jonah Goldberg, and I can't wait to jump into our conversation with Jonah about his brand new book, The Suicide of the West, which is a fantastic read and everybody should buy. But first, I'm going to tell you something else. So we're never going to agree on everything, but I think we can all agree that we can use more sleep. And getting a great night's sleep is easier and more affordable than you think. You don't need a new expensive mattress, sleeping pills. You just need to change your sheets, which is why you should check out Bull & Branch. Everything Bull & Branch makes, the bedding, the blankets, it's all made from pure 100% organic cotton, which means starts out super soft, gets even softer over time. You buy directly from them, so you're essentially paying wholesale prices. Luxury sheets can cost up to a thousand bucks in the store, but Bull & Branch sheets, those are only a couple of hundred bucks. Everybody who tries Bull & Branch sheets loves them. That's why they have thousands of five-star reviews. It's why we in the Shapiro household use Bull & Branch sheets. We got rid of all of our other sheets there. Aren't that good? And Forbes, Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, everybody's talking about Bull & Branch. Even three U.S. presidents, they'll remain unnamed, but they may include a president who cheated on his wife a lot. Sleep on Bull & Branch sheets. Shipping is free, and you can try them for 30 nights. If you don't love them, send them back for a refund. But I doubt that you'll want to send them back. There's no risk. There's no reason not to give them a try. To get you started, right now, my listeners get 50 bucks off your first set of sheets at bullandbranch.com, promo code Ben Guest, because we have a guest. Go to bullandbranch.com today for 50 bucks off your first set of sheets. That's B O L L and branch.com, promo code Ben Guest. Again, bullandbranch.com, promo code Ben Guest. Okay, so welcome to the show, it's Jonah Goldberg. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, you are second in importance to our advertisers, but you are still. First in our hearts. I understand and, that. I was great listening to you at, at one and a half speed. It was really kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's, so let's jump into, let's start with your book. And then we'll get okay. to like the everyday politics of sure, sure, uh, sure. Trump and, and all of that, which is, uh, I'm sure, the rank punditry that everyone will enjoy. But let, I want to start by talking about your best-selling book. Obviously, you're, you've been on the Times bestseller here for a while. Mm -hmm. And the, the book itself is an exploration into enlightenment ideals, why we got here and why we are falling off. So let's start with the easy question. Why are we falling off? This is the one that, that, that seems to be the most puzzling to folks. Like you, you talk in the book about we are falling off. We're falling back into tribalism, mm -hmm. that the Enlightenment is a, is a miracle that happens. You call it the miracle in the book. But why do you think people are disowning it? Why aren't we appreciating the stuff around us? Right. So um, one caveat. I like the Enlightenment. You know, what does two thumbs and likes the Enlightenment? This guy, <laughs> right? But um, I don't do what Stephen Pinker does and just say the Enlightenment was this one thing. Uh, I sort of taking a page from Mike Myers and so I married an axe murderer. When it comes to enlightenments, if it's not Scottish, it's crap. Okay. <laughs> so the, the French enlightenment is not my bag. I mean, there's some good guys in the French enlightenment, but it's not my bag. I think one of the reasons why we're falling off is essentially that we teach ingratitude, right? So I close the book with this big call for gratitude because this miracle, which is sort of liberal democratic capitalism, the rule of law, it's not just sort of the enlightenment or the free market at all. It's, it's, what, you know, what Cuba Gooding Jr. would call in, in Jerry Maguire, the Quan, right? It's the whole <laughs> package, right? Rather than be grateful for this unbelievable miracle that pulled us out of the muck of human history, you know, for 250,000, 300,000 years, man's natural environment was grinding poverty, punctuated by an early death, either from some bow stewing disease or violence, right? And then once and only once, because of some weird crap that happens in England, we start coming out of it. And to me, that's like the goose that lays the golden egg, right? It's a mystery. We still don't really know why it happened. There are lots of good theories, and I guess we're going to argue about some of them. But at the end of the day, there's no consensus on why it happened. And to me, I think that's a useful thing because, as, as Hayek or Schumpeter would say, capitalism depends on values. It cannot create uh, once lost and cannot restore either. So the, the trick is, is to sort of say, here comes this golden goose. It comes into our life. It lifts us out of poverty. It extends our lives. It, for the first time in human history, the average human being lives on more than $3 a day. You know, if I had a golden goose, I'd build a fence around it. I'd give it good food. I'd take care of it. What can I get you today, Mr. Goose, right? <laughs> and instead, we have a policy, a cultural policy, a suicidal policy from all the commanding heights of the culture to teach people to be ungrateful, right? The opposite of gratitude is entitlement and resentment. And the story, we teach that the story of America, the story of the West, the story of tyranny and oppression um, and cruelty and bigotry, when in reality, the story of the West is this amazing story of overcoming those things. Um, every civilization in all of human history since the agricultural revolution had slavery. Slavery is not what defines Western civilization. The fact that we ended it is, is one of the things that defines Western civilization. So I want to teach about things like slavery, but I want to teach them 
so we can tell people the good story about how we got rid of it, not that we had it. And, and instead, what you get from the sort of Howard Zinn crowd, from the identity politics crowd, are these arguments that basically say that it's no, it used to be our, our the, it used to be the argument was we're hypocritical, right? That we're not living up to our standards. I'm totally open to that, right? That's that was the moral grandeur of Martin Luther King's March on Washington speech. He was saying, "You guys aren't living up to the best story you tell about yourselves or and your Douglas, ideals." Yeah. Right, right. No problem with those kinds of indictments. I mean, I might disagree on the specifics, but as a principle, I'm no problem. Now the argument about free speech on campus. Um, about all sorts of once considered sort of ideals about individuality, about merit. Those ideals themselves are now being taught as being inherently suspect or oppressive or cruel or bigoted. And that is a suicidal choice. I think there are other things going on. Capitalism, um, capitalism doesn't just simply destroy bad customs. It also is um, relentlessly corrosive to good ones. And so it takes work and upkeep to maintain the family, to maintain institutions, to maintain um, religious organizations and religious commitments. Because the relentless rationalism of the marketplace, unless it is, it is sort of tempered and, and held at bay by other cultural norms, can have negative consequences as well. So, the, so that's you know, what is happening. But why? Why was it that uh, in, from the 1950s and on, basically, right. especially the United States, has decided that all of these old things need to be put away and right. capitalism needs to be assaulted? Where is that coming from? So there are theories about the Frankfurt School. There are mm. theories about the decline of religion in America, if you had to kind of create a description for what was the mindset that led to this rejection of the golden goose, right? where, where did that come from? Because the truth is that your book really should be called The Rise of the West, not The Suicide of the West. The vast majority of it is about how we got out of the muck in the first place. That's true. That's it's true. really only the very end you start talking about, you know, the, the ingratitude. But I guess I'm asking a different question, which is where is the ingratitude springing from? Like, okay, what, so why did I, that happen? I would make the argument, um, which is controversial in some places, that I've sort of had a reawakening or a rethinking about my understanding and my view towards ideology generally. I still love intellectual history. I still think I, I really like arguing about these subtle distinctions. But at the end of the day, I've come to believe that basically almost all forms of you can call it collectivism, socialism, you know, the cult of unity, moral equivalent of war, whatever, whatever labels you fascism, you want to put on these things. These are basically different trade names for the same impulse, which is this sort of tribal desire to get all your meaning from their group, the Rousseauian general will. And, and so since I bring up Rousseau, I'll say, I think that whether it's the Frankfurt School or, or some other sort of left-wing identity politics ideology, I think the, the, er, the original cause of our problems stem from essentially romanticism. Romanticism is a subject that no one wants to revisit because we've, we have bad memories of reading poets we didn't understand or something like that, <laughs> or not understanding paintings or whatever. That's fine. My understanding of romanticism is that basically it is the argument that your own personal feelings, your emotions, remember, emotions and feelings are just synonyms for your instincts, basically, right? For your gut. That these are the highest sources of truth. These are the highest sources of authenticity. And because part of my argument is that capitalism and democracy and the market are fundamentally unnatural phenomenon. This is that romanticism is really just your inner primitive screaming in your ear saying the world shouldn't be like this. And it takes on different forms in different places. Like Bernie so, Sanders' voice, presumably. It's sometimes it's Bernie <laughs> Sanders' voice. I mean, it takes, on, it takes on all sorts of fascinating different voices. But it is this whispering thing that says the inner lamp of your own feelings is what should illuminate the world. And we hear so much of this stuff about, you know, you know, from it's all over pop culture. I mean, animism informs rock and roll. It informs Star Wars movies. It informs all these kinds of things. Where you Trust your feelings, Luke, right? It's all this kind of stuff where... Any notions of external authority, traditional authority, are suspect. And that is a story that begins basically with the, the second the Enlightenment appears. Basically, there is this counter-reaction to it called Romanticism. And these two have been at war for all time. They've been at war. It is an inherent tension within Western civilization, within the Enlightenment-based democracies, that is this conflict between self-discipline and self-expression. You can put a thousand different labels on it. And I think a lot of our problems stem from the fact that in this, you know, this eternal battle between Locke and Rousseau, Rousseau has been winning for a long time. Everybody who controls the commanding heights of the culture, from academia to Hollywood to music, is basically, to one extent or another, in, on Team Rousseau rather than Team Locke. 
So when it comes to that conflict between Locke and Rousseau, there's a third character, just historically speaking, who is very informative, and that was Voltaire, who sort of sure. stood halfway between the two of them. And one of the, the critiques that I have of the sort of binary distinction between Locke and Rousseau mm -hmm. is that the French Revolution, was to, to paint this as a, a, a mere division between French Revolution politics and, and British Enlightenment, misses the fact that the French Revolution considered itself also based on reason. So it wasn't mm -hmm. a pure expression of romanticism alone. Voltaire considered himself the, the king of reason, essentially. Sure. Uh, there was a cult of reason in revolutionary France. This is one of my big problems with Stephen Pinker's book, is that he goes 450 pages talking about the Enlightenment and never mentions the French Revolution or any of the philosophy. Basically, he does this thing where if it's an Enlightenment philosopher that he doesn't like, it becomes a counter-Enlightenment philosopher. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I guess the question I'm asking is, are, are you doing some of that with romanticism? Are we, are we saying everyone I don't like is like Rousseau in this romantic category, or is there some crossover there? Because the truth is that Marx has one foot in rationality and one foot in romanticism. Sure. And it seems like there's a, a little bit more of blurring of lines than-, than Yeah, so no, that's, that's a great question. And I'm glad to finally get a substantive question on this. It's after three <laughs> weeks on the book tour. Um, so uh, I, um, I actually came out of working on this book liking Rousseau a lot more. Mm -hmm. He was a horrible human being, right? right? I mean, just, just horrible human being, but much more interesting, much more thoughtful than I had sort of given him credit, um, even though I'd read a bunch of Rousseau before. Part, again, part of my argument is, again, I, I don't think intellectual history works. I, I use Locke and Rousseau as symbols or stand-ins for two impulses, right? But these impulse, impulses run straight through the human heart. We're all a little Lockean. We all want to be recognized as individuals and make our own unique contributions to the world, that we're special, that if we were gone, the world would miss us, right? That's a very Lockean kind of thing. But we also want to be part of a group. We want to get derive some of our meaning from being part of a cause that's larger than ourselves. We want to derive some meaning for our contributions to a, some collective endeavor. Neither of those things are evil, right? Uh, and so part of my argument is that there that human nature is not inherently evil or good. Human nature is human nature. It's the one eternal constant. What is what is good or bad are the institutions and morals and customs that we create that channel human nature towards productive ends. So there's something very Rousseauian about being a believing, you know, Orthodox Jew as part of a larger community. No criticism for that whatsoever. What I have a problem with is when you take that sort of Rousseauian religious spirit, that affiliational spirit, and you try to get out of politics what you, what is only rightly right. reserved from religion, right? And it's that that would bring me to my my point about the the French revolutionaries. I agree with you that they they believe that they were invoking reason, but I think that the second you start talking about the cult of reason, and you declare that the Cathedral of Notre Dame will now be the temple of reason, and we're going to start over at year zero, there's something else going on. And so what the, 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 the and remember, all these guys were deeply influenced by Rousseau. I mean, they, uh, they basically- They marched as they disinterred him, and they marched his body through and reburied him. Yeah. That's right. I mean, they, they basically, I mean, they treated him the way the Iranians treated the body of the Ayatollah Khomeini. I mean, they really were nuts about him. And- um, and so one of the key differences, I would argue, between the sort of Scottish-British Enlightenment and the French Enlightenment is that the, the French Enlightenment sought to make reason a, a, a replacement for religion. And Robespierre and these guys were very honest about how they were trying to cultivate the religious instinct. They were also very intense nationalists, and they wanted to create this sort of the idea that the French were the new Jews, the new chosen nation, and all that. And, and so I think part of the problem... And this is something that I think is fascinating is that Rousseau picked up on this better than almost anybody else. He recognized that the French philosophers were behaving like the priests of the Catholic Church had in the Ancien Regime. They were committing the sin of what uh, an English philosopher, uh, Har Harrington, calls priestcraft, of sort of like the ancient Greek priests who claimed to have special knowledge about the innards of birds and could tell you whether or not you're going to win a war or whatever, right? They were using their guild-like power over the minds of men to manipulate people for their own benefit. And that's what Rousseau thought the philosophers and the, and the champions of reason were doing. What the other thing that the Jacobins and those guys believed in, which is, to borrow a phrase from social science, back guano crazy, uh, <laughs> they believed in the perfectibility of man. And that is the big difference, I think, between the English, between the two enlightenments, right? And I talk about this a little bit in the book. One of the great sort of illustrations, sort of like this Locke versus Rousseau thing between the two different cultures is, and Yuval Levin gets a lot of this in his book on Thomas Paine and Burke, the, the, the French gardens of Versailles, right? The typical Enlightenment French gardens are all these crazy corkscrew carved, you know, bushes where 
linear angles that can't be found in nature and all this kind of stuff. And the English and the English conception of a garden was just simply this zone of freedom where the inhabitants of the garden could be their best selves, right? So if you, as you've, you've all likes to point out in Burke, almost all of the metaphors in the language are about space, giving people space to pursue happiness as they see it, giving people space to fulfill themselves. All of the language from pain and or from the, the French was towards, was, was a direction. We're heading towards a promised land. We're heading towards a utopia. And that's why I think that I think there's that tension, you know, and that tension comes up, that story comes up over and over again in Western civilization of those who believe in the perfectibility of man. Because if you believe in the perfectibility of man, you also believe in the perfectibility of society because you can't get one without the other. And those who sort of take, like the founding fathers did, human nature as a constant, and the best you can hope for is a good society, not a perfect society. And I can't remember how we got here, but <laughs> that's, I think that'll do for now. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to ask you in, in just a second about the role of religion in all of this, because I know some of the criticism of your book, including some from me, yeah, has yeah. been about uh, going back further than the Enlightenment yes. and, and the roots of that. But before we get to that, first I want to say thanks to our sponsors over at Indochino. Every dude looks better in a suit. And Indochino is the world's largest made-to-measure menswear company. They've been featured in major publications, including GQ, Forbes, Fast Company. They make suits and shirts made to your exact measurements for a great fit. Dudes love the wide selection of high-quality fabrics, the options to personalize all the details, including your lapel, lining, monogram. So here's how it works. You visit a showroom or you shop online at Indochino.com. You can pick your fabric. You can choose your customizations. You can submit your measurements. And then you just wait for that custom suit to arrive in a few weeks. I did this over in Beverly Hills. It's really a great process. It's really enjoyable. And you get a really nice suit on the other end. This week, my listeners can get any premium Indochino suit for just $379 at Indochino.com when you enter Ben Guest at checkout. That's 50% off the regular price for a made-to-measure premium suit. Plus, shipping is free. That's Indochino.com, promo code Ben Guest, because I have a guest, for any premium suit for just $379 and free shipping. Incredible deal for a suit that will fit you better than anything off the rack ever could. Go check it out. It's Indochino.com, and our promo code is Ben Guest. Okay, so back to deeper yes. topics. So the... so. One of the distinctions that I, that I would make between mm -hmm. the French Revolution and the English Enlightenment Revolution is that a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers, putting aside for David Hume for a moment, uh, a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers were still ensconced in this, in a certain level of respect for Judeo-Christian tradition. Right? Sure. This is what Burke talks about in his rejection of the French Revolution, right. is this idea that we are, uh, that, that the Enlightenment Revolution in Britain was based on the idea of respect for a certain level of custom, whereas the French Revolution comes in and they just say everything is getting overturned. Right. It was specifically designed to strangle the last, the, what is it, strangle the, the last king with the guts of the last priest? Yeah, that's the Voltaire line. Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah, the Voltaire yeah, line. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it, that means that the rejection, the, the, are we going too far in prizing reason as the only value without enough respect to custom? Because I think that one of the things that may have happened in, in the latter half of the 20th century is exactly that. That on the one hand, you have this wild romanticism that you talk about. Right. And on the other hand, you have a materialist atheism that's arisen that's basically said we are sentient balls of meat wandering through the universe. Right. And we'll make, our own, we'll make our own purpose somehow, despite the fact we have no free will, we'll make our own purpose. And that this sort of takes the heart out of human beings, that this makes you ungrateful for the society that, that you have that's built on supposedly all these old, awful institutions we have to do away with. Right. So, you know, full disclosure, I am not an atheist. First sentence in the book is there's no God in this book because what I am trying to do is persuade people who disagree with me and appealing to God is a, is a as as the as this dispositive authority is a lot everybody off yeah it's a logical no fallacy unless you already stipulate that God did it right agreed so so I'm not an atheist I believe in God I I have enormous respect for religion I'm a bad Jew but I, <laughs> I but I feel guilty about it so I think there's hope for me and. Um, <laughs> And so I'm perfectly happy to pull a Jeremy Corbyn and say it all starts with the Jews, right? But, it, but, <laughs> but in a positive way, right? Um, and so, you know, my take on it would be that um, until the Jews come along, more or less, gods are our servants rather than our masters, right? There's a god for war, there's a god for fertility, you give them a bull, you sacrifice some pigeons, whatever, and they deliver. It's fee for service with gods, right? And every city state has got its own god. It's, you know, whatever. God is gumball machine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, um, it's sort of, it's got Uber, but for gods, right? <laughs> and then um, uh, and then the Jews come along and they say, no, no, man, you guys have got it completely wrong. Gods don't work. First of all, there's only one of them. And he doesn't work for you. You work for him, right? 
and he's watching you all of the time. All of the time, which is a huge bummer, right? And <laughs> and and a lot of things flow from this, including the sort of innate moral dignity of the individual, including for the first time in ancient societies, women, right? But it's still basically this tribal thing because it's just for the Jews, really, because they're they're in a in a in, in hostile territory. Mm-hmm. And then Christianity comes along. This is a sociological argument, but Christianity comes on and universalizes these Jewish precepts and says, no, 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 everybody is worthy of dignity. Everybody is worthy of respect. The golden rule is pretty, you know, important. Christianity also comes along and creates this vitally important thing for the emergence of capitalism and democracy, which is a social space where religion isn't dispositive of every question, right? So the Augustinian it, city of God versus city of man. Right, right. So it, it starts with Jesus saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, right? And then you have St. Augustine and a lot of people don't seem to know that the city of God and city of man aren't places. They're states of mind, right? right? And so there's some people who are just good Christians, and, but they're going to live amongst people who aren't. Just simply for on almost pragmatic terms, um, St. Augustine argues, you got to figure out a way for these people to live together without killing each other because ultimately God is the only person who knows who's saved and who's not, right? And that creates social space. Fast forward to the, you know, the religious wars of Europe, the Treaty of Westphalia was not a, um, no one was says, no one said, oh, we fought these religious wars for 100 years because we think there's this wonderful principle of religious tolerance. They're like, damn it, we just can't kill all the Huguenots. <laughs> I guess we're going to have to figure something out. <laughs> and they, and it's sort of this, this it's, 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 it's tolerance because of, of martial exhaustion, right? <laughs> and, and that's where concepts like free speech come out. The, the right to be wrong comes out of this, Social space that's created where no one institution can control everything. So one of the arguments I would make coming at this from a more secular perspective on it is, yeah, I entirely agree with you that we, you can go way too far with the reason stuff. I would, I, I, I'm sort of a Hayekian in my bones, which also makes me sort of a Burkean in my bones. I think that there is more what the Hayekian types would call embedded knowledge in social customs and norms than we can get our heads around, Right. There are, I mean, all of that, all of the cliches about how, you know, your grandmother was right about everything. Well, your grandmother was right about everything because she inherited this vast amount of trial and error wisdom that had accumulated over centuries or millennia. And you just think about all the embedded knowledge that goes into virtually any cuisine you can eat, right? I mean, how many people died from eating this poisonous thing or this undercooked thing or this spoiled that um, until they figured out how to cook food? You don't, it's like a price signal. You don't see all of the trial and error that goes into it. You just get the end product. And it's very much like Chesterton's fence. You know, we, we, the problem is, is that we are raising people now that we're raising generations of people, including among intellectuals, I would say almost particularly among intellectuals who think that just because they can't see the embedded wisdom and the trial and error that went into some custom or norm, there must not be any in it. Man does not live by bread alone. Man is a, you know, as Will, as Will Herberg, one of my favorite intellectuals would put it, man should probably be called homo religio. We are a religious, we are, we are religious beings. You can make a very strong case that it was an evolutionary adapt- adaptation that allowed us to survive because it, it breeds altruism and cooperation and all of these kinds of Harari things. Harari makes the case it allows you to expand beyond the 150-person group. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm open to all those arguments. I'm also open to the transcendent arguments. Mm-hmm. I, 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 my only point is, is that I think it's somewhere in Plato, you know, he makes this point that something can, if something is true, it's true for a lot of reasons, mm-hmm. right? The number of four equal is four because one plus one plus one plus one is four, but also because two plus two is four, you know, and all that kind of thing. You can come at it from a lot of different places. And one explanation doesn't invalidate other explanations. So it could all be just God's plan, or it could be evolution, or it could be both. But I, I certainly think that, you know, a big argument, about, a big part of my book is, you know, Hannah Arendt liked to say, every generation, Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children, right? <laughs> and um, uh, that's basically a big chunk of the argument of the book right there, is this idea that you're not born into some abstraction. You're born into an actual family. And your family is what civilizes you. It's what models good behavior. It's what teaches you right from wrong. It's what teaches you how to use a knife and fork. It's, you know, it teaches you all the little stuff and all of the big stuff. And it works on principles that have nothing to do, nothing to do with the market, right? I mean, I am literally, and I think I suspect you are too, you're far closer to a communist in your own family, right? 
course. Because yeah. in your own family, it really is from each according to their ability, each according to their yeah, need. Joint bank account, the whole deal. Yeah, you don't, <laughs> you don't, you don't charge your kids for food yet, right? You don't charge them rent yet. Um, if they behave. If they behave, right? You know, I give my kid rain or shine when I have to leave town. I handcuff her to the radiator and I give her a bowl of kibble, whether she's been good or bad. Because I'm that good a dad, right? And no, but my, my point is, is that the values yeah. of what Hayek would call the microcosm are not based on contracts and rationality. They're based on deep, powerful notions of solidarity and mutual obligation that are much better expressed and represented by religious concepts by you know moral concepts, not by rational concepts. And so a big part of my, you know, so Hayek in The Fatal Conceit talks about the microcosm and the macrocosm. In the microcosm, that's the world of kin, um, family, friends, where your values of reciprocity trump market notions, right? It's the Gemeinschaft versus the Gesellschaft. And in the macrocosm, that's, that's the world where you deal with strangers. That's, and one of the beautiful things about capitalism is it turns strangers into existen from existential enemies into customers. Right. And so you can't take the values of the microcosm and impose them on the macrocosm without destroying liberty. You cannot take the values of the macrocosm and apply them to the microcosm without destroying the, 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 the values and moral creating engine that is the family and civil society. And so the whole point is to keep them separate. Keep, you know, sort of like the... Reese's peanut butter cup commercial. You got to keep the Gemeinschaft out of the gazelle shaft. <laughs> and, and if you can do that, everything works. You know, if you treat your family like it's a business enterprise, you're going to destroy your family. If you treat the extended order of liberty like it's a family where the president is our father, you're going to destroy liberty. And so you got to keep these things separate. And capitalism is downstream of the value creating engine that is the family. And this is part of my point about why I say all of the stuff that is around us is an accident, right? I mean, the mo one of the most common explanations for where capitalism comes from is Max Weber's Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. I think there's a lot of merit to it, right? But what I always want to point out is even whether it's true or not, and I think there, you know, the idea that like Protestants invented savings is a little iffy for me, right? Right, now, and Venice was, was engaged in a fair bit of commerce right, for right. a long time. But even if you take it on its merits or its best case, you know, best face forward, it's still an accident, right? The, the Calvinists and the Puritans, they, they didn't say, if you behave this way, you'll, you'll get rich. They said, if you behave this way, odds are it's more likely that you might get into heaven. And it turns out that when you change your internal habits of the heart and your, your, your um, morals to things like thrift, delayed gratification, honest dealings, you're actually going to do better in business. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't the prosperity gospel, right? Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> the, the fact is, is that the that capitalism will fail if we don't civilize the barbarians that are born into our family to be citizens in this civilization. And I argue that one of the reasons why we have identity politics and all these other problems that are coming up is precisely because of family breakdown, because civil society is, is, is eroding. I mean, people are retreating into their homes to watch politics and stuff as an entertainment rather than... Um, they're finding a tribe outside engaging. their family. Yeah, they're, and these artificial tribes suck. Again, to borrow from social science. And, um, you know, Facebook is fine for keeping up with your old friends that you met in the real world. It is horrible for, like, actually creating a sense of real community because virtual community is not community. Yeah, I noticed that on Twitter. That was, that was one of the big lessons I've learned from yeah. Twitter. It's not, not an actual community, guys. It's actually more like a, a mob. But yeah. uh, let, let's talk about tribalism for a second. Sure. Because uh, there's been this, this rich debate. You and I are actually on one side of the debate, and I know that Rich Lowry and some others have been on the other side of the debate, the nationalism versus patriotism debate. Yeah. Uh, and I want to delve into that in just a second. But okay. first, I want to say thanks to our sponsors over at Man Crate. So here is the problem <laughs> with Father's Day. Dad is not going to tell you what to get him. Truth is, he doesn't know what he wants. But this Father's Day, you can give him a gift he is guaranteed to love with man crates. These are hand-picked, packaged gifts for every type of dad. They have the knife-making kit for the hands-on dad, the axe murderer, or the whiskey appreciation crate for fathers who like the finer things. Most gifts ship in a sealed wooden crate with a crowbar, so he actually gets to pry open the man crate with his own manly hands in front of everyone. When's the last time you gave your dad a gift he needed a crowbar to open? Probably never, but with man crates, you can, and it's awesome. You're giving your dad more than a gift. You're giving him a gift experience unlike any other. I have gotten... One from people at the office I was very grateful for. It was poker chips. It came out like an ammo can. It's really awesome. Plus, every man crate comes with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Get your special Father's Day discount today at mancrates.com slash Guest because I have a guest. This is a limited time offer only for Father's Day. Go, th go there today. It's mancrates.com slash Guest. One time, mancrates.com 
slash Ben Guest. Check it out. Okay, so. You know, if you studied ancient Greek, you would know that the correct pronunciation of that is mancrates. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> well, I'll have, to, I'll have to let the advertisers know that they, they've been messing it up all, this, all these years. So um, the nationalism versus patriotism it gets to some of the aspects of tribalism that we've talked about because there is, I think it's fair to say, good tribalism is in the tribalism of ideas. And then there is bad tribalism as in the tribalism of race or the tribalism of class. Things that you can't change about yourself that you are born into. This would be bad tribalism. And tribalism of ideas where you are part of a group because you identify as part of this group, uh, These would this would be a tribalism that is less likely to be a problem. Recently, I, I read a, a book by, it's about going to come out in September actually, by uh, Yoram Hazoni over mm-hmm. at the Herschel Institute. And he, he's a very big proponent of nationalism. Uh, and the reason that he's a proponent of nationalism and not just patriotism is he says that there are these set of customs and histories that play into the the creation of the tribe and to simply kind of intellectualize tribalism to, well, I agree with you on this list of propositions, therefore we are now part of the same tribe, ignores the fact that people have a natural inclination to identify with people who have a similar history, a similar culture, a similar language. What do you make of that argument? Is there any way to bridge that particular gap? So my, my standard analogy about all this is that Every poison is determined by the dose, right? And so nationalism is a little bit like salt. A pinch brings the meal together. It, it combines all the flavors well. It brings out the flavors. Um, it really sells the dish. A little too much, it ruins the dish. Way too much, it's literally toxic. And so I'm with Roger Scruton. I haven't read this. You know, I, I don't have the connections you do. So I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, gotten, the, I haven't gotten the bootleg copy of this book yet. But um, I have absolutely no problem with the arguments from people like my colleague Rich Lowry or from, from Roger Scruton that a little nationalism is essential. Um, you need some sort of sense of social solidarity and cultural affiliation that binds you together. My problem is, is that if you listen to uh, Raihan Salam or, or Rich, this, this idea of, na- of a politics of national unity to me is much more problematic because when you say that the highest ideal is not, not patriotism, which is basically a creedal idea, right? There's, like, there's a certain set of propositions that we agree on, but it's instead this sort of far more mystic idea. I mean, Ryan and Rich and Yoram are probably, I would think in fairness, not ethno-nationalists, right? They're not saying that only one ethnicity or true Americans or true Israelis or any of that kind of mm-hmm. stuff, right? But nationalism becomes very difficult to define, particularly in a multi-ethnic society, where there isn't an enormous amount of consensus around customs. And it turns out that the consensus is around the creedal stuff, not the, the, cult, the weird cultural stuff. And so manufacturing this sort of national, this, this concept of nationalism, I think very quickly becomes exclusionary to a lot of people. It will certainly be seen as exclusionary by a lot of people. But what concerns me more is getting, it's sort of getting back to this microcosm versus macrocosm stuff. The government in Washington or the central government is the only institution that has any claim of speaking for the whole nation. And so almost invariably, when political parties who have control of government take up the mantle of nationalism, it becomes, a, it becomes either socialism or some other form of statism. And one of the, it's weird, there's this vestigial thing from Marxism that still teaches people that socialism and nationalism are opposites, which is a fight that the Trotskyites lost in the Soviet Union in about 1926. They're not opposites. They're far more often the same thing. Read a speech by Fidel Castro. Read a speech by Hugo Chavez and replace every instance of the word socialist with nationalist and every instance of the word nationalism with socialism. It doesn't change the meaning of any of the sentences. When you nationalize an industry, you're socializing an industry. Nationalized healthcare is socialized medicine. So part of my problem with nationalism is that if you want to put teeth on the bones Oh, teeth on the bones, that's not right. If you want to put <laughs> flesh on the bones, uh, that's the cold medicine kicking in. If you want to put flesh on the bones on a nationalist program, the only way to do it is by having some sort of large federal and federal government endeavor. So that's part of my problem with it. I also, you know, it's also just worth pointing out that, that people think that nationalism is this ancient thing. It's also a product of romanticism. It, it first comes out uh, more or less in Germany as a response to the imposition first by the French Revolutionary Army and then by the Napoleonic Army of the Enlightenment, which was seen as a foreign French import. And so these guys like Johann Ficht and Johann Herder create these mythical notions of German national identity as a response to all that. And so ethno-nationalism is, is, is 
a fairly modern concept. There have always been countries, but this idea of national nationalism is a fairly recent thing, and it is in its origins inseparable from ethno nationalism. I think now you have a sort of you can have a civic nationalism. Actually, Rousseau is very good on civic national. Well, he also wants a totalitarian state and with the general will, but that, but <laughs> that side, one, yeah. one thing at a time, you know. Um, and so I I. It just makes me nervous. I, I think the founding, I, I very much want to flip the pyramid. I think that um, I want to send as much power down the most local level possible. Because when you do that, only the issues that really do unite us all will become federal issues or national issues, right? So abortion will probably rise to the top because it gets to the very question of who's a human being. Slavery rose to the top because it gets to the question of who's a human being. But beyond a couple of those kinds of things, Push everything else down to the most local level possible. The Founding Fathers argued, you know, in essentials, unity, in everything else, liberty. And the I don't understand, no one's been able to explain to me how a program of nationalism isn't also a program of centralizing and federal government empowerment. And I'm open to arguments, but I know, and Ramesh has made one point to me that, you know, some trade stuff could be, you know, like getting out of the Paris Accords, so both populist and nationalist, but also not centralizing. So there, I, I'm open to the possibility that there are more it's examples. from centralization outside the United States. That's yeah, right. I mean, it was a pullback from the globalists, right? But in general, uh, I, I think the internal logic of a nationalist program that emphasizes it rather than using it as sort of a background flavor with the pinch of salt invariably or has the danger of turning, of sliding into sort of top-down government again. So one of the things that, that's really fun that we get to do is we get to sit here and intellectualize about uh, the, the state of the conservative movement, if there is one. And I want to ask you about that because uh -huh. there's been so much written in the past few years, particularly since the rise of President Trump, about the, the state of the conservative movement. Both you and I uh, were, quote-unquote, never Trumpers in the sense that we did not vote for President Trump. I believe that, that uh, we would both consider ourselves that here's the way I define Never Trump. It ended the day of the election. Yeah, there's no too. more. There's no more Never Trump after that because now he's the president, and so right. he does good stuff and he does bad stuff. And right. when he does good stuff, yay. And when he does bad stuff, boo. Right. You have one president at a time. That was my. I, I wrote a column called Never Trump, Never More, where I said I wasn't going to start lying um, about the guy. I was still going to call balls and strikes as I see it. But he won. He only have one president at a time, and so my understanding of Never Trump was always a personal one, which was I wasn't going to vote for him. And I wasn't going to endorse him. I didn't. He won anyway. Congrats. So, so I've said basically, over. so you're in the yeah. sometimes Trump category, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's, that, right. that's, that's what right. I, it, yeah. so one, one of the pet peeves, obviously, that I think both of us have experienced is this constant refrain from some of the bigger Trump fans that we must be never Trump every time we cap, uh, every time we, we criticize him. Uh, how do you, how do you deal with, with that criticism? And do you think it's even honest at this point? I, I, I don't think that there's a lot of honesty to people who are labeling folks who clearly are not like never Trump is over. They, yeah. they just use it as, it's now being used as an epithet mm -hmm. in a time when the epithet no longer applies. I would say maybe there are a few people who are legit never Trumpers, in the, like maybe Brett Stevens. Sure. Um, Jennifer Jen Rubin. Rubin. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. David Frum. Yeah. But, but it's, it's, we can name them, right? It's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not like a movement. There's this, yeah. this, this weird sort of notion there's an existential threat from never Trumpers to take down Trump. I, I don't see that at all. In fact, I'm on the horn with people at the White House on a not infrequent basis talking to them because this doesn't exist anymore. Like right. Trump is the president. How do you how do you deal with this this kind of yeah no look address, it, it, I I share your frustration I think there's a fundamental and 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 it's it's difficult because some of the people who I think it's a very lazy shorthand right and some of the people who are doing it are friends of mine and I don't want to like get into I, I've I've lost enough friends in the last <laughs> two years you know and so but I think that what happens is, is is to give some of them credit one of the things I think that's going on is they don't want to name names either. Right. And so what they do is they just use never Trump as this catch all thing. The problem is when you use never Trump as a catch all, it very quickly becomes a straw man. And so people and so like people like you and me, you read what they say and you're like, well, wait, are they accusing me of this BS? You know, and it's like, well, I didn't I haven't done this. But since they're not naming names and since so many, you know, uh, people on Twitter and elsewhere just sort of refer to me or you or anybody who's ever criticized Trump as never Trump. They leave it so sufficiently ambiguous that you feel like maybe they're 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 taking a shot at you when maybe they don't have you in mind. Right? Maybe they do have Jen Rubin in mind. And so part of I, I think in a lot of ways it's a lot like the way neocon started to get used in the first part of of the Bush administration, where it 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 distorted more than it revealed, right? Yeah, it turned into you're either Jew or Iraq war supporter. Right. Uh, the, the new definition, or both. Bagel snarfing warmongers. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and um and uh 
And so, yeah, no, look, I, I, it, it is a, it is a, it is a frustrating thing. And what happens, and it, 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 what bothers me is sort of as a, as a writer is the way people use it as, as a way to score cheap points with all-out pro-Trump people by speaking truth to power, while at the, in reality they're speaking truth to a label that they don't put any details to. So, so now I'm going to ask you a tough question, which is, if you can grade President Trump so far, mm -hmm. I, I usually grade him along a couple of lines. I grade him on executive policy, I grade him on legislative policy, and I grade him on rhetoric, because uh -huh. it's very difficult to give him an overall grade because he's all over the place. In some places, he's, he's a hammer hitting a nail, and in some places, he's a hammer hitting a baby. Yeah. So how, do, how would you grade his, his administration so far? And then I'll ask you the, the brutal follow-up. So. Okay, so, so first of all, um, I, uh, I got to say that not a big fan of the moral equivalence between a hammer hitting a nail and a hammer hitting a baby. Yeah. But, um, Me neither. But. Uh, yeah, so uh, so I, I'm not going to weasel out of it. But I will say up front, there is a raging debate in Washington about how much of the, stu how much of the good stuff Trump has done has happened because of him or in spite of him, right? So uh, one of the things that drove me crazy about Steve Bannon and all that stuff was this constant drumbeat about how Mitch McConnell was the enemy of Donald Trump. Mitch McConnell has been the single greatest guarantor, guarantor of Trump's legacy among conservatives. He's the guy who's gotten all of these federal judges across the finish line. And he, I think... You know, I, do I agree with Mitch McConnell on everything? No, but I think he deserves enormous credit for that, um, not to be sort of demonized. And so a lot of the stuff, like the stuff that goes on with the EPA, the regulatory stuff, the FCC stuff, the, uh, uh, the FDA stuff, I think is great. I don't, I, I think that basically what Donald Trump has done is basically says, do all the good stuff, and then he just doesn't pay attention. I'll take that any day of the yes. week, yeah, you know. <laughs> but there is, this, there is this idea out there that he's actually managing and governing and paying attention to the details, when in reality, one of the sort of accidental byproducts of the way Trump came into office is that a lot of the regular party types wouldn't take jobs in the administration. And so the administration, thank goodness, went and got a lot of, including a lot of friends of mine, hardcore movement, think tank, um, true believers who went in there and said, who knows how long this thing's going to last? Let's get some stuff done, right? And so I'm all in favor of that. So, so going by the normal grading process, which is that whatever happens on a president's watch, that president gets credit for. On the domestic regulatory stuff, I give him, you know, somewhere between a B plus and an A minus. Okay, and then on foreign policy, how do you how do you grade him? I think there are a couple of things that only Trump would have done. Very few, but there are a few that are important, right? I mean, maybe Ted Cruz would have moved the embassy to Jerusalem. Maybe, maybe, you know. But almost none of the other guys would right. have, right? So the Jerusalem move, pulling out of Paris, which I think was a was not not the big deal people make it out to be, but symbolically was a big mm -hmm. deal. Well, reaching out to the Saudis and trying to actually broker a, an alliance. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. Although, again, I think, you know. It may have, be more of a byproduct of Obama's horrible. We have, yeah, policy. a lot of Trump's victories are the product of Obama's failures, right? And the Obama so messed up the 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 game board that he created these awesome opportunities for Trump to just sort of snap up. So on the foreign policy stuff, again, with the caveat that I, I don't think all of that much of it is as intentional as some of his biggest fans do. Still, a B plus, A minus. Okay, so, the, so then the, the, here's the brutal follow-up. So uh -huh. I'll ask you the brutal follow-up in one second. Uh -huh. But first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pitch some life insurance. So our friends over at Policy Genius. Make sure that you are covered in case you die. Now, you're not thinking you're going to die. I know. You're sitting there and you're thinking, listen, I'm just listening to this podcast. Why are you bothering me about death? Well, tough padoogies, folks. You're going to die. And that means that one day your family will be left bereft if you did not actually go out and get life insurance. Almost 100% of people think buying life insurance is a pain in the neck, however, and they are largely right, which is why Policy Genius exists. It's the easy way to ensure you can compare life insurance online. In just five minutes, you can compare quotes from the top insurers to find the best policy for you. Policy Genius has helped over 4 million people shop for insurance and placed over $20 billion in coverage. They don't just make life insurance easy. They also compare disability insurance and renter's insurance and health insurance. If you care about it, they can cover it. So if you've been thinking about getting life insurance, go to policygenius.com. It's the easy way to compare the top insurers and find the best policy for you. You'll be saving time and money and hassle, and it's free. Check out Policy Genius. Don't leave your family without money if you plot. Make sure that they're protected. Life insurance does not need to be a pain in the neck. Go into it, policygenius.com. Okay, so here is the brutal follow-up. The election is today. Do you vote for President Trump? Who's he running against? Uh, Joe Biden. 
Still probably not. I don't vote for Joe Biden either. I, I live in Washington D.C. I could, I truly couldn't give a really right. interesting. So so why so so why what's the what's the downside to voting for President Trump? Because I, I would basically say at this point, here was my view going into the election. And again, neither of us voted for President Trump. Yeah, in we're talking about cycle. we're having some weird 2018 special election, right? Right, exactly. Okay, it's a okay, weird 2018 okay. special election. Nothing has changed between now and 2020. Okay. He's gone into a basement. Right. Life is frozen. It's, it's, I mean, it's, I, I did it's, say if I lived in Ohio in 2016, I would have voted for Hillary Clinton. I mean, I, mean, I, would have voted for, 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 I wouldn't have voted for Hillary Clinton. I probably would have voted for Trump. Okay, right. So, it's, so yeah. the things that I was worried about with President Trump were threefold. I was worried that he was going to soul suck the party, mm -hmm. which seems to have happened somewhat among elected officials, but does not seem to have happened among the intelligentsia or mm -hmm. even the people who are necessarily conservative voters. Uh, certainly not conservative young voters who are people who I deal with on a frequent basis. Uh, I was worried that he was going to uh, turn that, that, that he was going to uh, pursue policies that were not conservative because he'd been all over the place, obviously. And then he's now governed as a pretty deeply conservative president, even if he doesn't believe mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff. And then there was my third worry, which is still my worry, which is that he would toxify the Republican Party brand for so long that it would actually do serious damage down the line for young people. My only alleviating concern there is that the damage may have already been done. So mm -hmm. if the damage is already done, then are you really making the damage any worse if, if he's president for eight years instead of four years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so with that said, if the election were held today against Joe Biden, I wouldn't have much of a problem pulling the lever for him. Even though I live in California, my vote doesn't yeah. matter. So what, what, what exactly is the, the biggest holdup for you? And I don't mean it to be a gotcha. Yeah, no, no, I get it. Um, you know, and I, I reserve the right to change my answer later. First of all, you know, a big part of my argument in my book is about the importance of rhetoric, right? That that basically this miracle that happens basically happened because the way we talk about ourselves to ourselves about ourselves changed profoundly. And I think as a matter of statesmanship and rhetoric, the way Donald Trump talks about this country, the way Donald Trump talks about politics, the way Donald Trump talks about his opposition, I think is more damaging both as a sort of just rank punditry brand question. But I also think it is sort of, it is, it is, damaging to our sort of political health in the long run. I also, you know, I am not convinced yet by any stretch of imagination that the Trump presidency ends well. My position has been from the beginning that, you know, character is destiny. And I don't know that. And, and I think that at the end of the day, the fundamental thing about Donald Trump is he's a person of bad character. And if someone could come up with a definition of good character that was plausible, but Donald Trump could clear, I would love to hear it. I have not heard it yet. Most of his values are basically sort of Nietzschean values, you know, winning, strength, defeating your enemies, getting praise. And that stuff really turns me off. So as a prudential question, I don't know, maybe I would vote for Trump in against Joe Biden in a weird 2018 sort of election. <laughs> but, but my stance towards Trump wouldn't change appreciably anyway as it is. I mean, this is... Right, that I agree with, obviously. Yeah. Is your critique of Trump, like the voting question is, is one that we just have to get off the table because so many people boil down your view to would you vote for him or not, which yeah, is exactly yeah. what happened in 2016, right? Yeah. It didn't matter. They, they, people stopped looking at the criticism and whether it was valid or not. It just right. turned into you were either a member of the tribe or you were not a member but of see, the tribe. But see, this is part of my problem with what's going on and it sort of gets to your never Trumper question from before. I keep trying to make this point that, that Trumpism should not be looked at as, as a ideological phenomenon. It is a psychological phenomenon. And both in terms of Trump's own brain, which, you know, he admits he's a guy who works on instinct. He wants to be flexible. He doesn't really care about conservative stuff. His support for conservative judges is entirely transactional. Thank God. You know, he basically, someone- Does not look like a gift horse in the mouth there. Yeah. Yes. You know, like, thank God. You know, someone told him, you just got to give the Federal Society and Leonard Leo carte blanche to come up with names and we'll love you for it. Great. That's fine. But this is the same guy who wanted to put his sister on the Supreme Court. And so what bothers me about the way the discourse works with Trump is that, for instance, anytime I ever praise Trump, it's, it just disappears like without a ripple, right? No one cares. No one, you know, no, no always Trump types say, good for you, Jonah, or anything like that. But I criticize him. There you go again, blah, 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 right? So there is this weird hyper tension about anything critical of Trump. And Trump encourages this because what he cares about most is praise. And so the best example of this, back when Bannon was still in office, because of the White House dress code, you could only have three layers of clothing. And um, uh, he was talking about primarying Mitch McConnell and all the establishment people, all this kind of stuff. 
because they weren't supporting the Trump agenda. Basically pelted Jeff Flake and Corker from public life, right? And tried to do the same thing with Sass. Um, and wanted to do it with McConnell. Well, McConnell voted with Trump's agenda in the Senate like 98%. He was Trump's agenda in the Senate. Corker was like 90%. Flake was like 88%. But what offended people about those guys wasn't their support, their lack of support for public policy agenda, because there wasn't a lack of support. It was that every now and then when Trump said something bad um, or worthy of criticism, they said something. And that drove his supporters crazy who only want to hear praise for him. And meanwhile, Rand Paul did more to undermine Donald Trump's agenda in the Senate in terms of repealing Obamacare and a few other things than almost anybody else, like this Gina Haspel thing. But Rand Paul keeps praise and honor upon Donald Trump. And so no one gets mad at him. So when people say, look, I just care. It's a transactional thing. I just care about Trump's agenda. I just want him to get things done. And yet they aim all their ire at anybody who criticizes Trump and not the people who actually undermine his agenda, I think something else is going on. And is it this psychological thing that borders on a cult of personality from people? And I think the motivations are all over the map. Some people just don't want to, um, they want everybody in the pool so that anything that comes out of the Trump presidency, no one can say, I told you so about. Some people just don't want to be reminded of their own hypocrisy. You know, there are a whole bunch of people who got very rich talking about the importance of moral values and fidelity and marriage and good character, who now say all of that stuff is prudery and they don't want to be reminded of it. I, I get the psychological phenomenon. I just haven't seen a lot of evidence that this is really about a policy agenda or, or anything like that. So one of the things that I think has happened here is there's been a conflation between anti-left and conservative. People mm -hmm. have decided these are both the same thing. Rush Limbaugh you know, is the granddaddy of so many of us in the conservative movement who grew up, for me, I grew up listening to Rush. The, in, in the middle of the last election cycle, he shifted the Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies and renamed it the Advanced Institute of Anti-Left Studies. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually renamed it. Uh, and for President Trump, it feels like a lot of the support for Trump comes from that, is that Trump hits the right people and he's hit by the right people. And therefore, whatever he does is worthy of, of praise and honor. How do we reestablish, you know, uh, it, the, the category of, of conservative falls inside anti-left, but mm -hmm. not everything anti-left falls inside conservative. How do we wrest control of the anti-left movement away from just being merely anti-left and more toward the classical liberal enlightenment values that yeah. you use thousands to the side of the West? No, it's, it's a good question. You know, Irving Crystal, Irving Crystal used to have a similar distinction. He used to say that, you know, that he was anti-left, not anti-state. And what he meant by that was he had no problem with public schools teaching good conservative moral values, but he had a huge problem if the public schools were going to teach absolutely crappy left-wing values. And so for him, an argument for school choice, I mean, I don't want to distort his position, but uh, from that perspective, an argument for school choice was, a, was because he needed a corrective to the bad values being taught, not the evil statism of the government funding public schools, right? And I think there's something similar going on today. I, I think that there's a... In a I think it's a fascinating die marker to see who gets upset about this when I say this, because it's happened a few times now. I think one of the things that has been deeply corrosive and corrupting on the right has, and I'm partly to blame for it, um, because I was one of the first authors to really um, shine a light on Saul Alinsky in my first book. But I was shining a light on Saul Alinsky to point out what a bad dude he was, right? I mean, he literally dedicates his book to Satan. <laughs> um, I mean, it seems like that's a tell. Um, and, uh, and so, um, and what happened over the last 10, 15 years is a bunch of people said, look how effective Alinsky was. And it says, what we got to do is we got to fight like them. And, and so what happens is it goes from being sort of the conservative mindset, as you put it, to the anti-left mindset. And the problem is, is that when at some point, if you argue that uh, we need to adopt our enemy's means for our own ends, it becomes very easy as a fact of human nature to, to, to lose sight of what your ends were in the first place, and the means become self-justifying. And so that's why, you know, so, as I put it in the book, so much of our politics this day, these days on the left and the right is defined by what I call ecstatic schadenfreude, is just that things are worth doing solely because liberal That's tears exactly. are delicious, right? right? You know, I get it as a joke, and I look, I've made a nice living for a long time eating bowls full of liberal tears and all the rest, but that can't be the only justification, right? If, if a, it's like, 
I, you know, you talk to a lot more campuses than I do, but I, you know, I've probably been on 100 campuses the last 15 years. And, you know, one of the things I always try to tell young college kids is just because being a jackass is politically incorrect is not an argument for being a jackass. Yep. And, uh, and, but that's the kind of confusion you get when you mistake means for ends, you know, and you want to collect liberal tears because you win arguments. You don't want to collect liberal tears just because you're a, a cruel jackass. And, but if you can confuse the means and ends, all of a sudden, everything becomes self-justifying. Okay, so before we take off, I, I want to ask, aside from your book, we're, we're talking about the, the creation of good citizens and the, uh -huh. and the creation of people who believe in the Enlightenment. What are the, what are the three to five other books that you would have people read to educate themselves as good citizens who, who understand these values properly? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, we'll put aside the entire Shapiro oeuvre. No, you, no, no. You, <laughs> as well, you should. They, they don't fit into this. My next um, book, maybe, but not, not, not the ones I've written. So uh, yeah, so uh, Tom Sowell's Conflict of Visions, uh, Friedrich Hayek's The Fatal Conceit. Not because I think it's his best book, but I do think it's the most accessible book that gets at a lot of this stuff. I would not say The Road to Serfdom. Uh, gosh, what else? I mean, I'm a big believer in history. I like that, you know, Deirdre McCloskey was a big influence on me on all these books, and I like her books but I'm not sure they get to the core of raising good citizens. Whatever the best biography of George Washington is, I think would be pretty useful. And then as a follow-on to that, Rick Burkheiser's book on George Washington's uh, Guide to Manners and Civility, because I think that, that stuff is really, really important. And again, you know, this is, this is more of a gotcha question than the Trump stuff. I'm just trying <laughs> it's to get hard, yeah. You know, I, I, doing book list is rough. Yeah, no, and it's just, it's off the top of your head. And then you spend the next three weeks with that Esprit Escalier thing. Oh, I should have said this. I should have said that. <laughs> it's a fairly good reading list, so you don't have yeah, to come I mean, with others. There, so there's a book I really love that almost no one has ever heard of that I was just reminded of today because his son thanked me for mentioning it on Twitter this morning. Uh, Arthur E. Kirk called The Decline of American Liberalism. It's pretty largely forgotten, but it's a great history about how charting sort of how liberalism went from meaning classical liberalism in America to meaning sort of collectivism. And I think it's a kind of a useful thing and it's pretty digestible. But I, I reserve the right to come up with a whole <laughs> new list of books when I think about it. Well, good news is you're on Twitter, so we can definitely find it there <laughs> and, and you'll tweet it out when you think of it. Okay, last question for you. So for that, that's for the people who uh, listen to the show, you mm -hmm. know, probably people who are 14 and up. Uh, but you're, you're a parent, obviously. How do you bring up your kids to appreciate these values. Like, how, do, how do you actually convey these values to, to small kids? So when I grew up, yeah. a lot of it was religiously based. It was sure. the idea of responsibility and you are responsible for your own actions and values and have consequences. But how, what measures would you take and do you take in raising your own kids to believe in this sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, so, you know, this is a tough one for me because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fully cognizant of my own shortfalls and my own, my own hypocrisy on some of these things. And I think any parent one, one piece of advice I would give for parents, all parents, is hypocrisy is useful for illuminating some of your shortcomings or some of your ideals and how you're failing to live up to them. But if your biggest concern is being a hypocrite as a parent, you're a crappy parent. Because I, I'll be very clear about this, my decision tree went awry in my youth. And I, <laughs> I, have, I have made mistakes. I've woken up in hotels covered with blood that wasn't my own. There are all sorts of things that I would not you know, that I have no problem whatsoever being a hypocrite about and saying, don't do as I did, do as I say, right? Because uh, part of being a parent is learning some lessons about your life and trying to like... Part of building a civilization is yeah. doing this. We just That's did right. what we kept doing. We'd That's be back right. in the Stone Age. That's also. right. Embedded knowledge is a hugely important thing, right? Trial and error is a hugely important thing. That's my general advice for parents. You know, uh, towards the end of the book, you know, uh, as we were talking about before this, you know, God kind of sneaks back in the book. And I think that uh, whatever your views on organized religion are and, and or what denomination or faith you are, there is something truly wonderful and important that comes with the concept of being God-fearing in the sense that if you, if you truly believe that God is watching you, right? It's a, sort of a Hallmark card thing, but it's, you know, good character is what you do when no one else is watching. And if, if you have it in your mind that, you know, God is watching what you're doing, even when other people aren't. I think that is a great gut check for, for kids. It's something I teach my daughter to act as if, you know, somebody up there is watching what you're doing. You know, and as, as our people would say, the rest is commentary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, you know, just as a note, 
the importance of understanding that you know conservatism rightly understood and liberalism rightly understood should see politics as a very small slice of your life. And so one of the things I struggle with is, you know, my kid comes home. I'm sure this happens with you or it's going out. Your kids are younger than my kid. But um, I was almost some really dumb crap, you know, about, <laughs> you know. And so like one, one day my, my daughter came back having just covered Woodrow Wilson. And... To and, your house, yeah, perfect. Yeah, no, it was, it was like... <laughs> Not I started, like you wrote an entire book about how the guy's I, I, kind of a fascist. I, yeah. start, <laughs> I started to turn green and the buttons start popping off my... You know, it was like... And, and I try not to sort of ha- make my politics her burden at school. But at the same... So I, I, one of the things I just try to do to her is say, hey, look, this defines my career and my life, but it, it's, it's, the important stuff is stuff we do as a family, stuff we do with the dogs, stuff, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think that is an important thing because so much, so many of the problems we have in our life are that um, not only is lifestyle being politicized, but our politics are being lifestyleized. It is simply a, you know, there, it is, it is, it is a, almost a fashion choice, but a deeply meaningful fashion choice to people about how you vote, how you think about politics, the words you say. And I hate all of that crap. And I hate it on the right and I hate it on the left. The important stuff in life is about faith, family, friends, experiences. You know, you should live a life. One of the things I try to impress on her is that, you know, without getting too deep in the weeds about death, but, you know, that at the end of your life, you want a eulogy, not a resume. And that's the stuff that I try to teach her. Well, Jonah Goldberg, it really is an amazing pleasure to have you on the show. I it's really appreciate you stopping yeah. by. And everybody should go out and purchase a copy of Suicide of the West or five and give them at, to all your friends. At least one copy. At least one copy. <laughs> Don't just borrow it from a friend. Buy it. It's the Suicide of the West. Jonah Goldberg, thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you for having me. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday special was produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Associate producers, Mathis Glover and Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. Title credits by Cynthia Angulo. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday special is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.